a Netflix original film. The Wi-Fi is working. In the event of a global communications breakdown, do the following. Stay inside. What just happened here is happening everywhere. Avoid strangers. We've all been deserted. I don't trust them. And most importantly, do not panic. Julia Roberts. What happens next? Mahershala Ali. I knew something was coming. Leave the world behind. Rated R. Now playing only on Netflix. Today on CityCast Portland, we're talking about how a suspect in Multnomah County's largest fentanyl bust ever was able to just walk out of jail, the big recommendations from Governor Kotek's Downtown Portland Task Force, and Superintendent Guadalupe Guerrero stepping down from his post after a contentious teacher strike. Joining me on this week's News Roundup are Oregonian reporter Zane Sparling and our very own executive producer, John Atariani. It's Friday, December 15th. I'm Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. Welcome, everyone, to the Friday News Roundup. Zane, John, thanks for being here. Hey. Guys, it's been uh, a a mere 104 days since I've last been on CityCast. I know. (laughs) (laughs) You counted? I counted. Your audience has been emailing every day. Oh, wow. Where's Zane? (laughs) <laughs> uh, around the hundred day mark, we really started to feel it. Yeah, <laughs> it's so great to see both of you, uh, John and Claudia. This is my first time sharing some some audio uh, with Zane, and so if you're new to the show, today is a day we break down some of the biggest local stories of the week with some of the best and brightest journalists in town, like Zane Sparling here, and of course John. John, Aww, you thank you. This, I mean, well, last week you made a whole big deal about that. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we jump into the news, I like to ask our guests an opening question just so everyone at home can get a feel for who's who, you know, so they can like properly address their hate mail. Because sometimes I don't say everything, <laughs> guys. It's not always me who says stuff. Do you actually uh, get hate mail? Oh, uh, no. I get, you know, what I think of it is like, oh, everyone's caring at me, you know? Oh. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> um Are you guys ready for your opening question? Yes, let's do it. All right. So this week we're doing one in the style of Kiss, Mary Thruple. We're going back to the classics. Mm. So Zane, it's a lot like Kiss, Mary Kill, but instead of kill, it's Thruple, meaning you love it so much you would have a very complicated and committed relationship with it. Oh. Yeah. John, you might want to write this stuff down. (laughs) I I actually have my fingers ready to take notes because I've gotten confused in the past. (laughs) Get so confused. He's like, wait, what? What are we talking about? I feel like I can easily remember like two things at a time. Beyond that, we're we're into note-taking territory. John, you can go first. (laughs) (laughs) All right, guys. Here's the framing. It's how Portland celebrates Christmas, Thanksgiving, or New Year's Eve. Like how you feel about it living in Portland and how Portland makes you feel during those holidays, if that makes sense. So I know you can have your personal feelings about the holidays, um, but since we're looking at it, through the lens of our city, uh, I figured I would just go since it's a little abstract <laughs> and you might mm-hmm. want to wrap your head around it for a sec. So first, I would kiss Thanksgiving. I would marry New Year's Eve and I would thruple Christmas. And here's why. I grew up loving Thanksgiving because I love food and low stake family hangouts that don't include single parents crying or going broke. But as I've gotten older, I've become more aware of the real history of Thanksgiving and I'm kind of a little over it, but we could still kiss because some of my favorite Thanksgiving memories are friend dinners, and I've had them here in Portland, and I love making food with friends. So mm-hmm. all smoochies, Thanksgiving. Merry New Year's Eve because I love a fresh start, and Portland restaurants have the best fancy New Year's Eve dinners. Uh, I can't think of a better way to ring in the new year uh, than like an ostentations like prefix menu. And I'm thruppling Christmas because I feel like it gets along with New Year's pretty well. Mm. And Portland has elevated their seasonal game with opening that skate rink and like the woodsy winter village. And I now live in a neighborhood that had like official tree lighting. I don't know, John, if you were there, I was, uh, we live in the same neighborhood and like there's lights. Ever- it's just so cute. And, you know, shout out to like Portland parks and rec for grabbing that plot of land for the, where the, the skating rink is. Cause that was them. Um, and I'm hoping more seasonal markets and third spaces for downtown, uh, end up there. That would be awesome. So it make it gives me hope, you know, so yeah, Christmas. 
Hmm, okay, I got it. So I think that my pick on like Portland specific, it would be different than what I would pick for the holidays just baldly on their own. Mm-hmm. So I want to caveat that. Um, kiss New Year's Eve because like – New Year's Eve is like kind of a lot, you know, it's fun, it's exciting, you know, it can it can even be like a little, little woo woo, it can be a little racy, but like <laughs> at the end of the day, New Year's Eve always feels a little bit hollow. You come out the other side, you're like probably a little bit hungover, you're feeling a little rough around the edges, and I feel like I can't do that every day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I would marry Christmas in Portland because... Um, I think we've got a pretty good thing going in terms of like Christmas energy, Uh, big Christmas tree energy, one of the biggest Christmas tree producers in the world, or at least in the country. I'm not sure about the world. BTE, Um, that's what it's called, by the way, big Christmas tree energy. Big big tree energy, of course. Yeah. Yeah. How could I forget? Um, (laughs) Claudia, I did go out and I did Christmas ships last night for the first time. I went out to the sextant up on the Columbia and like watched the Christmas ships, which was like, it was was cute, you know? And I feel like that's what you want in something that you're going to marry like something that's cute something reliable ritualistic you know ritualistic you yeah and i would throuple thanksgiving because i feel like thanksgiving is inherently the most complicated holiday i've had the most friendsgivings mm. i've had the most like sort of like fun but unfamiliar social situations at thanksgiving in portland where it's like i'm hanging out with a good friend and like four people who i've never met before who like I think I get along with, but I really don't know them. I remember I had one Thanksgiving where I was hanging out on a porch with a dude in a bear costume, (laughs) but I didn't know him well enough to ask why he was in a bear costume on Thanksgiving. To me, that's like big thruple energy. So that's why I pick thruple for Thanksgiving. I love that you're like, I don't want to be rude. (laughs) <laughs> I would immediately be like, bro, what's up with the bear costume? I wouldn't even say hi first. <laughs> I love it, John. Zane, what about you? All right. So uh eight night stand with Hanukkah. Wait, no. Um I'm I'm gonna go with kissing uh Christmas because it is because it is a holiday we've celebrated um in my house and it's uh you know it's fun. I think I would go that you really need to Merry, ma- Merry New Year's Eve because New Year's Eve, you know, you make you make a New Year's resolution. Mm-hmm. Mine is always the same to finish my novel. I never do <laughs> it. So, in the spirit of broken vows, like marrying New Year's Eve is, <laughs> is pretty obvious. Um, and then Thropple with Thanksgiving. I mean, it's the most complicated holiday, especially here in Portland. Uh, we all know people probably who don't celebrate it anymore. And I've always just felt like. It's really just it's cold, and that's why all the holidays are now. It's because it's cold. I we we always have a great time on Thanksgiving. I don't think we've ever once discussed the pilgrims. I think it's just eating food, and and also really because my parents live here, I always have a family Thanksgiving, so I am left out, just like in the real throuples of this world. Yeah. So. <laughs> Solid, Zane. Solid. <laughs> I can now tell why. You know, you had all those emails, those hundred days you weren't here. (laughs) (laughs) There were no emails. (laughs) Okay. okay. (laughs) I would have believed you. We kept going. Guys, thank you. That was solid. Thank you for your uh, dedication to keeping us on our toes. Yeah. Yeah, You know it. (laughs) Well, uh, are you guys ready for the news of the week? Yes. All right. All right. Let's go on. Zane, you're sharing a story you wrote, right? I love when our guests bring us some fresh reporting. Take it away. All right, so we do have some breaking news here on for drug dealers in the audience. Um, Luis Funes has been rearrested. If you've been following the story, this mm. it was back last Thursday when the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office, their deputies, they had this massive drug bust. They found over 50 pounds of powdered fentanyl, $30,000 in cash, three firearms. I mean, this was like an AK-47. And their triumph, which they were touting in the media, turned into a farce because it was revealed that the ringleader of this alleged narcotics trafficking organization had already been released. And the reason for that, now he is back in jail. They did catch up to him during a traffic stop. But the reason he was released, despite this massive drug bust, is that he was booked on his old warrants. He wasn't charged with anything relating to this massive drug deal, drug organization. Instead, he was charged with essentially low-level street dealing. That's like, you know, having a pocket full of pills on the corner of 4th and Main. And in Multnomah County and a lot of places in Oregon, the rules of who is held in jail 
after they are arrested, who has to wait around until a judge can look at the case is set by a rule book. It's set by standard instructions. And in Oregon, right, you know, he was charged with nonviolent offenses. There were probable cause affidavits. The police were saying things, right? But there's this, this wacky woke document called the Constitution, which says you're innocent until proven guilty. He was not convicted. He had no prior convictions. He had two nonviolent offenses and he was let out because that's that's the rule. It was a standard decision. I think that's my question. Maybe I've been living the story, but John, Claudia, my question for y'all is like, what do we think the rules should be in terms of drug dealing, right? Like it is a nonviolent offense. Though fentanyl does kill people. Mm -hmm. You're not. Do you guys think, I mean, if someone is just arrested with, you know, essentially who's using fentanyl is also selling it. Is that someone who needs to be held in bars for a long time before their case can be decided, given that, again, innocent until proven guilty. Right. I mean, you know, 52 pounds of fentanyl. I, it, I think it was in your reporting, Zane. That's 11 million potentially lethal doses. So, like, just on the face of it, like, no, that person should not be allowed <laughs> to walk out of jail. Obviously. Yeah. What, what, what I didn't understand, Zane, since he was booked on the previous warrant, was this actually a screw up within the Justice Department or were they following the letter of the law in releasing him? It, it was a screw up. The sheriff's office was the arresting agency. And typically when you arrest someone, you want to refer your police reports to the DA's office and the police lodge you on charges. And then the DA has to decide if they're going to go through with that. But the police do make an initial not charging decision, but they do, you know, throw some spaghetti at the wall. Mm. They didn't do that. Um, the other thing they could have done is gone up to the feds, right? Like we've all seen the wire and they would go to the feds and they would say, hey, you know, like this guy's a bad dude. Most uh, interstate narcotics crimes are prosecuted by the feds, right? So they could right. have said, hey, tell the U.S. Marshals to put a hold on this guy and then you guys can, and he'll stay in jail while you guys think of charges. And in fact, that's what they've done now. And they did that with one of the alleged accomplices. But the first time they arrested uh, this accused ringleader, they didn't do that. I mean, I've asked the sheriff's office, like, explain why it's not your fault. Explain why it's someone else's fault. And then those emails just go uh, unanswered. So I, as far as I know, this was an error. I think a lot of commentators, right, think that like DA Mike Schmidt showed up with a Camaro and like let this guy into the backseat. They drove off in the sunset. Oh my God, I would. You know what? If he did do that, I'd be like, good for him. <laughs> That's not what happened, though. That's not what happened. That's not. Yeah. What happened. You know what I worry about, you guys, is that I read. You know, not of course, not only your article on this, but I read a few other you know, media outlets and, and something very similar, as you were explaining, kind of happened where they kind of just followed exactly what the sheriff said, which is, hey, we followed the law to the letter, just like as John asked. And that releasing officer was just doing what the judge wanted. And like, we're just, uh, you know, but I'm like, <laughs> no, but this is like you said, he wasn't charged correctly. That should have been escalated. That should have been kicked up. 11 million overdoses, <laughs> potentially. That's definitely a federal crime at that point. Um, so my concern is that this is going to be used as a platform for people running for mayor pretty soon, promising like harsher penalties for drug dealers that they can't deliver because those penalties are already there. You know, and it's just like, no, this is what mm. happens when the police don't do their job effectively. I mean, do you think that's saying or do you think like there are some holes we could plug up so this doesn't happen again? You, you know, I the, the so again, these release rules, they're set there. There's no human discretion. It's just, you know, what are you charged with and what is your history? Right. Mm -hmm. So if he had been charged, if he'd been lodged in the jail on having what is unfortunately the, the legal term is a super, super in quotes amount of drugs, he would have been held. The, the, the rules already allow for that. It was really mm -hmm. just an error in the lodging or if, if you know, more likely an error in the, the feds and the sheriff's office not quite having their ducks in a row and getting that federal hold placed immediately on this guy. I mean, that's again, as far as we can tell. So yeah, the sad realization I've had writing these type of stories before is that people will never ever, the general public will never ever understand how release guidelines work. And <laughs> they will yeah. just go and say, it's it's the government's fault. And it's like, no, it was a complex series of factors. Yeah. So I'm just curious, like, what's going to happen now? Do you know, Zane? Like, yeah, no, I, I, I think he'll be held um, until the feds can can figure out what they want to charge him with. At that point, he'll be assigned presumably a, a federal public defender. There will, of course, be a federal prosecutor. They'll all meet in the courthouse. I'm sure our reporter, Maxine Bernstein, who covers the, the federal courthouse, will be there. 
they'll both make their case to a judge and a judge. And I'm guessing the feds will say, hey, don't let this guy out. The defender is going to say, no, he's a nice guy. You know, he, he deserves a second chance or, or, or at least make, you know, his best effort. And then from there, a judge will decide. So mm. which is how the system is supposed to work, right? Given that everyone is presumed innocent until proven guilty, it is up to a human, a judge to decide, you know, in, in every case that, you know, what, whether or not someone should be allowed out of jail. Right. Well, I, my, my only thought on this is I was sort of floored to read that somebody was arrested with 52 pounds of powdered fentanyl until I read that last month <laughs> they found somebody with 127 pounds of fentanyl in their car in Klamath County. So, like, the fact that wow. this isn't even an isolated incident is just just makes me really sad. And yeah. Yeah. This, I mean, this guy's 23, you know, we call him a ringleader. And I think he was running the shop for whoever uh, probably sent him those 52 pounds of fentanyl. But let's be real like this. He's not El Chapo. He was the 7-Eleven yeah. manager helping distribute fentanyl. Mm -hmm. uh, well, he's going to be uh, charged like El Chapo. So, <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter there. All right. Well, let's take a quick break here. And when we return, more news of the week. So my story uh, this week uh, is is by a few reporters, actually, because it was a huge story. So I, I relied on the reporting of Dirk Vanderhart from OPB and Shane Dixon Cavanaugh from The Oregonian. I'm sure a really good friend of yours, Zane. So Best both, buds. Yeah, both <laughs> friends of the pod. Uh, <laughs> they wrote articles breaking down some of the recommendations that came out of Kotex Portland Central City Task Force. Now, that's a very large group made up of like 46 business people, politicians, and others with a stake in downtown Portland. For example, like the mayor and U.S. Representative Earl Blumenauer, who was also just on the show. And if you heard that episode, you would have heard that Representative Blumenauer said that he has a lot of faith in Governor Kotek's leadership uh, during this time, which was weirdly comforting to hear. I'm just like, mm -hmm. oh, I love when like politicians politic at me. I'm like, mm, warm <laughs> hug. Uh, so if you haven't heard about this task force, it was announced back in August and they set up a four month deadline and only three in-person meetings to get these objectives out, like these recommendations. So uh, these are right on time. And these, this also came like this task force came after Governor Kotek told both the county and the city leadership that she was kind of disappointed in them uh, pretty publicly. So... I think the first meeting was a little contentious with city leadership. Like Mayor Wheeler came in pretty strong with um, big teen energy, another BTE, mm. you know, <laughs> <laughs> just like, oh, yeah, well, why don't you fix racism? You know what I mean? Just like so. <laughs> you know? I mean, he was asking for stuff that was, but it just felt a little combative. Like when, you know, when they were just like, dude, are you are you trying to work with everyone? Or are you just going to like yell about money? Mm -hmm. Anyhow. Which, of course, people should be yelling about money because this is going to cost a lot of money. So these uh, are the big items that Governor Kotek will be pressing state and local leadership on. And for sure, this is something that Mayor Wheeler did ask about, which is an increase in security in downtown Portland. So more police patrols, more park rangers, and more private security officers outlawing public drug consumption, which I thought was illegal this entire time in Portland, and it was just not being enforced, but looking through city code section, because I was ready to be like, isn't that illegal? <laughs> but I looked through city code section and on unlawful acts involving alcohol and controlled substances of prescription drugs, Zane's already like, mm -hmm, I had to read this too. It doesn't explicitly say anything about public use of controlled substances. It definitely mm. says we can't drink in public, but there's no clear language on harder drugs. So yeah, how about we do ban public drug consumption? Um, <laughs> there's also more aggressive prosecutions against suspected drug dealers because it's it has to go up to the state. It's not like if anyone here is a commissioner who's running for mayor say, oh, I'm going to do this. They can't. This has to be like a state uh, mandated thing as well. It comes down from them. So which from Zane's story, like it might be needed. Um, there's also going to be increase in social services, but like daytime services, you guys, like an outreach workers. Uh, mm -hmm. And Kotec is also recommending tax relief to downtown businesses, and she wants to declare a 90-day state of emergency uh, to refocus officials on this fentanyl addiction crisis, which is crazy. Like, what does that mean? Like, a 90-day state of emergency? 
Like, yeah. I don't even understand. And the other thing, this is the one that I was like, oh, how are we going to do this? They're like, we're going to take the protective plywood of all buildings, all of them, come down, and we're going to pour millions into graffiti and trash cleanup, and also establishing volunteer groups such as Solve and Adopt One Block and providing additional city money for public art installations. And one thing to note out of all this that I just said is that billboards reading Portland is not a trash can might be going up because of this initiative. And I just really think we need to like rethink that branding strategy. Oh my gosh, I want a t-shirt. <laughs> Portland is not a trash can. It's supposed to signal this enticing campaign for citizens to get involved. But I feel like it's just like asking to get bullied nationally. So I, I grew up in the Midwest and I spent a fair amount of time in Toledo, Ohio. And I remember I went to a block party there once and there was somebody who was selling t-shirts like hotcakes that just says Toledo. It's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's where we're going. Maybe you could pitch that as like a city fundraiser oh, for, for Portland. <laughs> Portland, we're okay. But okay. I feel like they should maybe just go to Wine and Kennedy just like for a lunch and just talk to them about it. Like maybe Wine and Kennedy could come up with like something just a little better. Yeah. And I'm sure they'd be happy to. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't put these up. Um, but anyhow, Mayor Wheeler gave his thumbs up. He told OPB that the recommendations from the task force are in perfect alignment with the work that we're already doing. And some of his suggestions did make it. So he's stoked and he's hopeful that Kotick will commit state dollars to see some of these recommendations come through. What are your thoughts? I feel super mixed about this because Ooh. like, you're, you're right. Like a lot of this is aligned with the things that the city needs. A lot of this is aligned with things that the city is already doing, you know, uh, like the idea of creating more homeless services. Like, yes, I think that we've been yeah. working on that for a while. The idea that we're going to clean up ODOT properties. Like, yes, we've been doing that. Like a lot of these things are already in play. And like, I'm just confused about like the action measure here, you know, like, sure, the governor can say that the city needs to do what the city is already attempting to do. But like, if that doesn't fill into the legislature, and if that doesn't act, you know, if there aren't actually laws paced around this, then what happens? And the other thing that I'm really confused about is that, like, there's some really, I think, crucially necessary, like, public safety things here, talking about crime, talking about, like, real livability issues. But then there's, like, a lot of aesthetic things, like, I don't love plywood on buildings downtown, but I don't know that that's a priority to the tune of millions of dollars on top of everything else that we have going on. And there's a proposal in here to cut taxes in downtown business districts, which is like also an idea that I'm interested in. I like the idea of getting more uh, businesses into empty storefronts. But like if the governor doesn't have a plan to back up that tax revenue, then like how is this actually going to come together? I just, I don't know. I, I feel really skeptical of like, even though I'm on board with most, if not all of the recommendations here, I'm really skeptical with how it's going to be implemented. You know, I think I speak for the general public when I say that's it. I mean, this was in a word underwhelming. I wondered if chat GPT maybe wrote some of these <gasps> recommendations. <laughs> I, I, I think that some of them, like you said, John, just obvious, like, yeah, like we, we should, you know, have less trash on the streets. Like that's something we've been doing for a long time. Other of these are, I think, kind of unfeasible. Are we going to order private property owners to take down their plywood? I mean, that would be a horrible optics issue if those people are saying, hey, you're forcing me to get robbed. I mean, we're not mm -hmm. actually going to do that. I'd like to see the implementation on a on some sort of, you know, uh, holding off on business taxes or some sort of business tax holiday, because what's going to stop people from just getting a P.O. box in downtown Portland and not meaningfully increasing the amount of employment in downtown? Mm -hmm. I, I personally think that downtown is not as bad as people say as someone who actually works down there. And second off, the reason that downtown feels worse is that remote work is here to stay. And the reality is that as we've all seen in the CityCast logo, we're currently in that building that has that giant microphone on top of it. That's where we are. <laughs> <laughs> but most of the people who are listening to this probably either work from home or don't go into the office every day anymore. And that's not going to change in the foreseeable future. I think that if Kotek had really wanted to make a splash here, that she co-chairs this committee, right? These are her name is on this, right? These are her ideas. I think she should have gone way bigger. I mean, she should have talked about, let's let's give out a lot of money to redevelop some of these empty office buildings. I know mm -hmm. that would be controversial because it would be a, a tax break for developers, but could we actually do that? Um, could we take the Clean Energy Fund money and just use it to build 
uh, say, you know, the Southwest Corridor light rail line or to underground the Markham Bridge, put that in a tunnel. I mean, do something crazy. That would have been a game changer. These to me were basically what we all expected. And some of that is already happening, right? Zane, like, didn't we just see this week that Carmen Rubio is proposing pulling money out of the Clean Energy Fund to use for like other departments? Like that is an actual like, Mm -hmm. we have money here. I want to put it there as opposed to being like, I think the streets should be clean. Um, (laughs) And and another thing that like just bugs me about this, I just got a bad taste in my mouth about how this whole process went. I feel like when this task force was announced, we were told that there was going to be some visibility to it. And like it all happened behind closed doors. Like, we couldn't even figure out when these meetings were happening. Like, I remember that the first meeting was really, really well reported, but then there was supposed to be another one in September. And like, on our team, we couldn't even figure out when it was going to occur. So like, these sorts of decisions being made behind closed doors is also something that just really rubs me the wrong way and not how I want like major decisions about our region being made. They faced a lot of criticism for shielding their meetings. I mean, I think we've all been like, that's whack. <laughs> like, yeah. What's going on? But I just wanted to say something like I haven't seen a timeline reported on like how this is going to roll out. But I do think that there is a difference in just like saying all these things that everybody's been wanting to hear or that we've been working on um, in a void and also in a 46 like person task force that now everyone there also feels like they are part of this team that now has to be part of the solutions. And I think that was a big reason for this. Everyone was working on their own, including the city and county. And I think with Kotek, um, how she's approached this, there's going to be more of a unified force moving forward on how they're mm-hmm. going to deal with this. Because as we all know, like the city and the county have not even been spending the amount of money they have yeah. for houseless services. And that's a big deal. Like they can't even get that together, how they're going to spend this money. So I feel like this is the big reason she's like, all right, everyone in this room, let's talk about this. And so, yeah, these are the same stuff that everyone's been saying we should be doing. But she's like, but now it's going to happen. <laughs> because they're all on the same page. And I think that's what this was all about, was getting everyone on the same page. Not so yeah. much reinventing the wheel, but just being like, we're all doing this, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so I feel like that is going to be a positive. But uh, there, the other criticism that I didn't hear you guys bring up is that uh, there's been a lot of criticism <laughs> for banning public drug use, which I was surprised. Like, I was like, what? We all be on the same page, but the American Civil Liberties Union in Oregon, which I'm going to be honest here, I had a hard time letting into my heart this criticism. I was like, no, but I do hear it now. Like they're thinking banning public use will push some addicts into the shadows and make it harder to reach them. It also pushes addicts through our justice system, which can be even more traumatizing. Uh, and none of that is serving them. And they also just say it doesn't work, which is, yeah, like an addict at jail is still an addict. But I just don't think that's a strong enough reason for what we have now, <laughs> because there's no end in sight and there's no plan B here. And if you can't drink in public, then I'm just saying maybe you shouldn't be able to shoot up or smoke fentanyl. Um, <laughs> that should just be like a basic social contract. I hate saying it, but mm. like we live in a society, <laughs> you know? Uh, and I just feel like there shouldn't be, I, I know I'm saying that with great privilege, but also like it just, it feels like coddling at a certain point. I don't know. Where do you guys stand on that? Sorry, you're coming down with me. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's so tricky. I mean, like I am not in favor of like public drug use and of needles being mm-hmm. in the streets and like just, it's just you know, not. just the, the extremity. And I think that there is probably some revision of Measure 110 that addresses some of this without like turning downtown Portland back into like a police state that incarcerates people at a uh, moment's notice. And I worry that like we're not going to hit that target. And like if we have two extremes, if we have two options of like going back to like a mass incarceration system where anybody who is an addict is immediately a criminal and gets caught up in the criminal justice system for the rest of their lives, which is where we were for a lot of the last 30 years in America, or having public drug use on the streets, I am more in favor of having public drug use on the streets. Mm. There is a middle ground there that I hope we can get, and I'm really worried that we're just going to pogo and swing all the way into the other direction. I just don't, yeah. And here's the reason why I'm like, it's not going to, I feel like both are fear-based talks, you know? Mm -hmm. And the reality is that the position of these controlled substances will still be legal. It's just like, hey, buddy, don't do it in front of this child at a park. And I feel like that's just a basic thing. Like, don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's just a political question. You know, it's a question of like who 
who we like put into political office to like draft and enforce these rules. And when you're looking at some of the people who are beginning to line up to uh, lead our city, you know, in 2024, like I do not think that they're going to have moderate policies on this. I think that we're hearing very aggressive policies coming out from certain political figures about these sorts of issues. So it gives me pause. Yeah. You know, the only thing I would add is that if this does come to pass and public drug use is recriminalized, I mean, we have a crisis on the lack of public defenders. So, you know, this person who does drugs, they're going to get arrested. They're going to go to the jail. Uh, the release guidelines are going to say it's a nonviolent offense. The person will be released a few hours later. There will be a no attorney. Even if they're held, there's not going to be attorney available to appoint them. And the charges may often end up getting dismissed just because of that. Or the DA might even decline to prosecute. Mm-hmm. So... I mean, I, I, we shouldn't think that this is a, the first goose step into uh, fascism necessarily to recriminalize drug use in public. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I, I think that, you know, there's sort of this talking point that the, that jails it forced me to get sober because I was in jail. But if you look at the number of those 10 jail deaths that we recently have had in the downtown jail, mm-hmm. uh, two were fentanyl. One was cocaine. I believe a third is suspected to be fentanyl. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not like the jail is necessarily a great place to get sober anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, one other thing, Claudia, I, I just wanted to respond. You know, I was a little negative about these recommendations from the governor and, and her task force. And certainly there is a call to think bigger at the same time, like, Portland is the economic powerhouse of the entire state. And Mm -hmm. I think it's a good thing that when our elected leaders like really drill down and focus on Portland's woes and want to make it a better place. So it's not a bad thing that this that, that, you know, the leaders are studying these issues. Yeah, agreed. All right, John, what about your story? My story, talking about Portland Public Schools again and saying farewell to Superintendent Guadalupe Guerrero. Uh, Just took the district and the union through a very contentious uh, strike and agreement, Uh, but he announced earlier this week that he's not seeking a third contract extension. He's going to be stepping down early next year after about six and a half years leading Portland Public Schools. Uh, His last day is going to be February 16th at the helm. He was the first Latino superintendent of PPS, and I think it's just really interesting to sort of think about uh, his legacy and what he was able to accomplish and not accomplish in his time uh, leading the district. I feel pretty confident to say that in a lot of ways, PPS is in a better place than it was when he stepped in. And they've definitely gone through some bullshit in between. There was this pandemic that happened. But it's not a perfect tenure either. And like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I think that when somebody leaves office, it's easy to say, like, they did amazing or like, they were terrible, throw the bum Mm -hmm. out. And at least for me, I feel really mixed on his tenure. What did you guys think when you saw that he was stepping down? Oh, boy. So I did talk to (laughs) the Oregonian's excellent uh, schools reporter, Julia Silverman, alongside Mm -hmm. some other great reporters you guys talked to recently, like Natalie Pate. Um, You know, I don't think there's much of a width of scandal here. I don't think that he was forced out or that there's any sort of other shoe to drop, at least as far as I know. I imagine he was maybe looking at the end result of that labor contract, right? And the reality that PPS (laughs) now needs to... Yeah. potentially raise some more money from the taxpayers or do layoffs, right? And that with PPS in a bad fiscal position, he probably thought it's time. I've got my PERS check. I am going to go find a nice quiet spot where I can fish or read or macrame or whatever the superintendent does in his free time. <laughs> okay. Can I tell you what he does in his free time? Cause I've been waiting. I was like, someone's got to say something smart first and then I'm going to say something really dumb. Okay. So <laughs> thank you Zane for smart. Here comes dumb. So Guerrero said that he plans to use this pause in his professional career to focus on, you know, his health and re-engage with his family, take a long road trip, maybe, Maybe, I don't know, return to producing and performing rock music. What? Yes. No. Quoted. Please tell me you went down the Google hole and found <laughs> yeah. Guerrero's yes, old rock Yes, this is what band. he said. Oh, no. Well, <laughs> <laughs> now I feel like I'm going to disappoint you, but no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> drop that band camp link. What era? What era of music streaming oh, do you think would God. have been peak for Guerrero? Do you think he like had a MySpace La- page? LimeWire? I don't know. Do you know. think it was like, do you think he was like CD single era? Like- <laughs> yeah. But guys, if anyone out there is just like, oh yeah, I was in Guerrero's rock band. Like, can you just drop us a link? But what I'm hoping is that he does put out an album and it's like a diss album, like a la Taylor Swift, 
you know, like some bad breakup processing about <laughs> <laughs> about the strike. Yeah, dear Oregon legislature. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's just like we'll we'll listen to it and be like, oh man, he hates us. You check the show guides. I think there's Guerrero and the cost of living adjustments. They're playing somewhere. <laughs> Guerrero and cola. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. I did just dumb that conversation up. Go ahead. Smart stuff. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, here's, here's some smart stuff. Um, <laughs> so the thing that I think is interesting and like what I'm sort of curious about is enrollment in the district. The district has already been seeing a huge amount of declines in enrollment over the past five or six years. Mm -hmm. And like some of the chatter that I was seeing was that after this contract and particularly without the changes to class sizes that like there is worries that the Portland public school system is going to continue to see declining enrollment, which would make the job of superintendent ever more difficult. So I'm not saying that is why he decided to step away from the job. I just, I, I, I found that interesting and it, and it made me curious whether the two had any sort of correlation. Yeah. You know, it's so tough. I mean, housing prices have made it so much harder for young families to move to Portland. I think mm -hmm. that's a huge issue. Yeah. Um, and certainly some people are just voting with their feet probably because they don't like Portland anymore or they think it costs too much to live here, uh, which are real concerns, of course. So, yeah, I, I think we need to we need a broader solution for some of these issues that like just making it easier for young families to to come to this to, to this city and, and enjoy everything Portland has to offer. Yeah. 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 Um, I did just do another search just in case I like <laughs> missed a, a nook or a cranny on the Internet. And I did find a SoundCloud but I don't think it's him. I oh. think there might be another Guadalupe Guerrero. But yeah, I'm sorry, John. This, it's okay. This can be our investigative piece for 2024. We'll <laughs> Someone out there knows. Someone right? out there, Someone knows, out the there knows. I want this bad. Get in our <laughs> inbox. We want to hear. <laughs> awesome. Well, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today and going over some of the headlines of the week. Zane, you are invited anytime. Come back. I will see you March 27th, 2024. <laughs> oh, he had that ready from the go. <laughs> wow. I'm in, I'm impressed. Thank you. It was a great, thank you both. It was a great time. Yeah, thank you. And Claudia, I'll see you um, tomorrow, probably. Later like today. In five minutes, John. Like in I'll five see you minutes. in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I love John's like, I want to play too. <laughs> Bye, guys. Before we head out, I wanted to share a note from a listener who wrote in response to Tuesday's show, 10 Essential Rules for Surviving Portland. Nick C says, after listening to today's episode, I'm, all capital here, shocked, shocked I tell you, that there's no mention of the Portland thank you you must provide to the TriMet bus driver as you leave out the back door. Nick, you are absolutely correct. That seems to be a Portland quirk, possibly a leftover nicety from our smaller town days that I personally hope never goes away. Did we miss any other essential rules for living in Portland that you'd like to share with any newcomers? We'll link to that episode in our show notes if you haven't caught up. And you can write us at any time at portland at citycast.fm. That's all for today here on CityCast Portland. Thank you for listening. Our executive producer is John Atariani. Our producers this week were Julia Fioioni, Dylan Brogan, and Natalie Rivera. Our newsletter editor is Rachel Monahan, and our host is me. Claudia Meza. Original music by Jenny Conley and Stephen Drizos. Additional music by Epidemic Sound and All the Kimonos. We'll be back Monday morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's.